Investigators from the Vancouver Police Department executed multiple search warrants yesterday as part of an ongoing investigation into the operations of the Drug User Liberation Front, or DOLF, a Vancouver-based organization that is publicly admitted to trafficking controlled substances, including heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. We understand the magnitude of the ongoing overdose crisis and the impact drug toxicity deaths have in communities throughout the province, including here in Vancouver. While Dolph's actions were intended to reduce the harms caused by the toxic, illicit drug supply, we have always warned that anyone who violates the Criminal Code or the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act should expect to face enforcement and criminal charges. This group was knowingly illegally trafficking in drugs. As a result, we took action to stop it. In addition to searching Dolph's office located at East Hastings in Columbia Street, investigators also executed search warrants at two East Vancouver homes linked to the investigation. Two adults were arrested and were subsequently released. Investigators are now working to conclude the investigation and will consider recommending criminal charges related to drug trafficking. The Vancouver Police Department has worked collaboratively with health and community partners for decades to support innovative approaches to drug policy. In 2003, the VPD supported the launch of InSight, the first supervised injection site in North America. Then, in 2006, we were the first Canadian police agency to stop routinely attending overdose calls in recognition that automatic police attendance could be a barrier to people calling 911 during a medical emergency. Further, the VPD was a leading advocate in the police community for prescribed safe supply to combat the harms associated with the toxic illicit drug supply. In recent years, we've been a leading advocate for decriminalization of drugs for personal consumption in British Columbia, and we're proud to see that achieved in 2023. While we support progressive drug policy and believe harm reduction strategies do reduce the number of lives lost due to drug toxicity, we are steadfast in our insistence that all strategies deployed must be fully compliant with the law. Anyone who ignores the law or fails to obtain the required legal exemptions should expect to be the subject of enforcement action. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Can you tell us, um, I would imagine you seized some amount of drugs at the uh, Columbia and Hastings location. Can you tell us how much drugs and what kinds of drugs you seized there? Yes, sir. I can tell you uh, qualitatively the kinds. I can tell you that uh, there are substances that we believe are heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Uh, investigators worked late into the evening last night, uh, and they have seized uh, numerous suspected drugs, and they're actively working right now. I saw them this morning. Uh, they are back in the office actively analyzing, weighing. So in terms of a, a quantitative specific amount, I don't have that information at this time. But that is definitely uh, evidence that we're collecting today. I trying to get a sense of, of, this group has been doing this for a while. I'm trying to get a sense of what was the impetus for the action yesterday. Like why, why didn't you guys act months ago or next week? What, what happened to make now the time that you went ahead? Very good question. And, and on the flip side of your question, I think uh, I've also heard, um, you know, with police investigations, sometimes people will say, well, aren't there higher priorities such, you know, as, um, you know, organized crime, violence, uh, people trafficking um, um, drugs such as fentanyl associated to illicit drug deaths. And we always try to strike a balance, and it's really a question of prioritization and prioritizing what our enforcement efforts are. Um, you know, obviously, there's competing investigations. Uh, with Dolph, we were obviously aware of them uh, being a community-based organization. And initially, when we came to uh, understand who they were, uh, a lot of their actions, I would say, were uh, surrounding protest events, such as International Overdose Awareness Day, which is typically marked on August 31st each year, uh, or at milestone occasions such as, you know, tragically, when we saw in uh, 2021 and then 2022, record numbers of overdose deaths. And there was typically uh, protest events where we'd see the group and see some of the activities. But what I can say changed to answer your question uh, was definitely through the course of the investigation, uh, knowledge in terms of 
their activities not being uh, you know, two or three times a year, but being uh, essentially on a regular reoccurring basis, and the, the volume of drugs trafficked is, are factors that we would consider in terms of taking enforcement action. Again, they've been around for a while. So how long has it been about you? Or what happened to the previous decide to move ahead yesterday? I, I can say that the, the beginning of the investigation was in early September of this year. So about a month and a half ago, the investigation uh, was initiated and led us to enforcement yesterday. So Inspector, you, know, you mentioned regular um, ongoing occurrences, and, and you know on the downtown east side, regular ongoing occurrences of drug trafficking happens all the time. It has been decades. And even before the criminal laws happened, a lot of people um, in that community have told us that, you know, police essentially leave this alone. So but why not? And, and so I wouldn't say that. What I would say is there's always a prioritization that occurs in, in terms of multiple competing uh, potential investigations. And the fact that we don't immediately take enforcement action um, or that there's other investigations such as ones we've brought you uh, this year in terms of you know, illicit fentanyl labs where fentanyl is being manufactured, produced, high level trafficking, people trafficking on the order of like 100 kilograms of, of hard drugs. Obviously those are higher priority investigations, but the fact that we don't immediately take enforcement action doesn't by any means mean that we are you know, turning a blind eye, condoning, or saying that we're not going to take enforcement action. It's just a matter of, of prioritization. Is there a concern just, uh, obviously, valve operators are sort of this, uh, you know, they advertise themselves as sort of safe supply. Is there a concern that um, this seizure could maybe force someone who might have had access to what you had seized, now going into maybe the illicit, well, I'm not going to say they're all illicit market, but going into the market and maybe getting something potentially more toxic? Absolutely, and that's definitely like uh, a co an unintended consequence that we don't want to see. Uh, that's not something we're ever trying to achieve. We fully support safe supply. Um, it's something that we work with our partners, whether uh, in government uh, or community-based organizations, to achieve. But it has to be legal. Uh, and where we see groups, uh, you know, well publicized, we saw Mr. Jerry Martin early this year in uh, May. That was well publicized in local media. Uh, set up a shop in the downtown east side with a with a tiny home and, and start uh, trafficking drugs that he said were tested uh, and were held out to be safe. Uh, similarly, you know, we said at that time we will take enforcement action and within a day, um, you know, enforcement action occurred. So we try to be entirely transparent with what our messaging is, uh, entirely clear in what people in the community can expect from us, uh, and consistent in terms of what our approach is. If people are knowingly, actively breaking the law, if they're trafficking drugs, they should expect enforcement. What have been the level of, of engagement with Bill? How long have you been maybe telling them to stop doing what they're doing before you crack down on I mean, I think it was. I think it was something that you know, even in local media reports and all the uh, the media uh, reports that are out there. I think it was quite clear. You know, people that have commented, whether it's different levels of government, have commented that their actions clearly appear to be illegal. Uh, as well as you know, there's media reports out there, uh, media engagements uh, members of Dolph have done, where they've even stated themselves they're abundantly clear that their actions are illegal. So um, I don't think this was uh, anything that was a you know a, an onus on the police to. Ad to advise them that their actions were in conflict with the law. I believe that uh, you know, people externally that looked at this or even members of the organization themselves understood that their actions were illegal. Uh, didn't Jeremy and Eris come and do a presentation to the police at some point about what they were doing? There's been, there's been engagement uh, with Dolph. It's certainly like we're happy to engage with people throughout our community, whether they're you know, government-based uh, people who use drugs, uh, organizations that represent people who use drugs, so, um, you know, we are familiar with Dolph. Uh, it's, it's a group that's known to us. It's part, you know, we're always approachable to anyone in our community, but we will never condone uh, people acting outside of the law. Uh, we've worked collaboratively with groups, whether it's to achieve decriminalization, you know, two decades ago, uh, to support Insight being open. There is a legal process uh, to seek the legal exemptions to operate in any kind of innovative drug policy. It's a section uh, 56 under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act that allows for exceptions to be made and that is the avenue, that is the vehicle to bring about innovative drug policy and we've always been consistent in that message whether to Dolph or whether to any other group that we deal with that is the vehicle that has to be used and ultimately the strategies that we bring online have to conform with the law. Why is it necessary to make these two arrests? Uh, ultimately, with, uh, in, in support of executing the search warrants uh, to secure evidence, 
uh, and ultimately confirm essential elements of the offense like identity. Um, and so arrests are required to be made in that instance. Uh, the two individuals, the adults that were arrested, were released. Uh, there's no need, we're not seeking their continued further detention and we're always mindful about uh, you know, our actions and, and the uh, impact it has on making an arrest. How many hours were they detained? Um, I would have to get back to you on specifics, but I can say uh, the two adults that were arrested were released last night. Related specifically to those arrests, can you tell us who they were that were arrested and what their connection is to the organization? I can't, uh, and it's not out of an unwillingness to be uh, entirely transparent. It's just a matter of privacy uh, in any case until charges are formally uh, laid by Crown Counsel, uh, we will not identify people that we arrest in an investigation. Is it fair to say though that they were part of the executive of the group or were they just happy to be in the state? I, I will say that they were associated to the organization, um, you know, and obviously, you know, if individuals that were arrested wish to uh, self-identify themselves, that's, uh, that's something that they're able to do, but it's uh, not something that we will proactively do. I'm just going to cut in here, everybody, before we go around the room for a second round of questions. I think there are uh, some reporters in the room who haven't had an opportunity to ask the first question. Brendan, in the back, you've been uh, trying to ask a question for this. Yeah. Go ahead. We're going back a little ways. Uh, you said part of the uh, interest for the investigation was finding out how much uh, they were distributing, uh, how often. Uh, how often and how much did you guys find out? Uh, it's definitely part of the investigation, so I can't uh, comment on specifics, but I can say it definitely. Uh, the investigation uh, quickly led us to believe that it wasn't uh, a case of being, you know, two or three times a year uh, isolated protest-based actions, that this was, you know, a regularly occurring um, action. So that obviously changed the, the prioritization for us as an organization. Um, yeah, you know, you have, uh, with the evidence that you have now, what kind of charges might be possible? Uh, we'd be looking typically at, at drug charges. Uh, namely, uh, possession for the purpose of trafficking, uh, and then different substances. So, if you if you traffic in different substances, um, each of those in and of themselves. So, you know, trafficking, uh, possession for the purpose of trafficking cocaine is one charge. Uh, if you had another substance, it's another charge. So, uh, charges in this in this realm. Are you preparing a charge package right now? Uh, it is something that investigators will look at. It's ultimately up to their discretion on whether or not to to recommend charges to Crown Counsel. Uh, but that will form the next uh, part of our investigation. Yeah, one intriguing part of this story is this particular organization was actually getting funded by the provincial government. A substantial amount of money, we've seen the records, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year. Albeit they said the money wasn't going to buy the drugs, but I'm just curious, have you guys ever done a drug arrest like this on an organization that was an official contractor to the provincial health organization? I mean, I, I couldn't comment specifically. We've always had uh, we've had investigations in the past where um, you know there's definitely been intersection with health providers. Even going back, uh, dating myself, uh, back when I was a younger officer in 2003, a lot of people might forget, uh, or probably young in the room, uh, that you know in 2003, uh, before Insight was formally and legally open, uh, there was actually you know a push by several groups to open you know essentially illegal, unsanctioned. Uh, what now we'd refer to as overdose prevention sites. Uh, and with that, you know, there was definitely enforcement action that was taken. Uh, and those sites, to varying degrees, could involve uh, different levels of government or different local agencies. So, I mean, I think, you know, when you get to the, the space of, of drug policy, there's always, you know, it is a place that, uh, you know, is part enforcement and involves the police, but also, of course, involves health partners, community-based organizations. So it's, I wouldn't say this is a, a first in 2016, when Sarah Blythe and other activists opened an unsanctioned overdose prevention site, why were arrests not made then? I can't, I can't speak to that. I wasn't uh, uh, involved in our, uh, in our drug policy at that point. Uh, and I wasn't part of those discussions, so I, I couldn't you know, speculate on why that is the case. And you know, with any of these things, whether it, you know, it was insight um, you know, back 20 years ago, it wasn't a matter of, it wasn't ideologically based. It wasn't the police saying, you know, we support this type of programming or we do not. Our messaging then, 20 years ago, was essentially the same. That, you know, we're supportive of innovation, we were supportive of insight, but it has to be achieved in a legal and lawful manner. Um, and whether that's overdose prevention sites now, fully supportive, I think we have, uh, you know, over a dozen overdose prevention sites in the city of Vancouver. We're fully supportive of those sites, but again, we would say that you know these need to be legally brought online and in compliance with the law. 
So what do you say to the people now who are probably going to likely join the street drugs or the few older prevention sites that are around after, you say, over you know, two decades, if it took them this long to even get to that? You know, we encourage people to, you know, seek resources in the community. We appreciate, you know, the scope, uh, you know, the appalling magnitude of the overdose crisis. You know, the, the, the fact that, you know, over 12,500 British Columbians have died since April 2016 when the overdose crisis was declared by then uh, Dr. Perry Kendall, who was our chief medical officer in the province. Um, and, you know, the scope of the, the magnitude of the crisis is not lost on us. We have absolute understanding. Um, of the effect it has on people throughout our city, across the province, and the resulting need on police, government partners, community-based organizations uh, to innovate, to look, uh, to do things differently, to reduce deaths. And so we're committed to having those conversations. We're committing, uh, committed to innovating, having uncomfortable conversations, uh, but ultimately, with anything that's arrived at, it has to conform with the law, it has to be legal. Sorry, I don't reply first. Ah, that's okay. Um, I just, related to the province and the federal government, I'm wondering if you could say whether anyone from either the Solicitor General's office or anyone else within the government was aware of the search warrant happening either before or after. That I don't believe in terms of before and in terms of um, you know government involvement. I can say that this investigation um, was an initiated investigation by the Vancouver Police Department. This wasn't um, you know involving uh, any other organization or level of government. This was a uh, a VPD initiated investigation. Okay, we've got time for one or two more questions. Go ahead, Paul. That's fine. I, I actually went down to the, the site when it was opening and they showed me the safe. Um, there was a staggering amount of drugs that they had in the safe in the back. Uh, it begs the question um, how were they able to source hard drugs in those amounts? And do you know anything about? where they got those drugs from, and will part of your investigation be trying to identify the criminal organizations that were capable and were able to bring in drugs in those amounts? Great question. Absolutely, it's something that we'll look at in the investigation. Um, I believe by comments of members of, of DOLF themselves in, in media engagements they have done, uh, they have specifically discussed the reality that they are sourcing the substances from the dark web, is what has been reported. Uh, and with, uh, for us, uh, you know, we're quite transparent as an organization. There's three major public safety threats that I would uh, argue occur in Vancouver and in many communities across uh, our province, and that is the overdose crisis, which is fueled by illicit drug toxicity, uh, the ongoing uh, gang violence that we see, the ongoing uh, BC gang conflict, which is fueled by fighting over the illicit drug trade and the resulting profitability, uh, and lastly, overall crime which you know, in Vancouver, roughly two thirds of all of our crime is property crime. And it's almost, you know, the vast majority of that is fueled by unaddressed substance use disorder, or what people will casually call addiction, uh, and untreated mental health. And so we look across all three of these areas and we're eager to see public safety gains in all three areas. Um, but you know, in looking at drug policy and innovating in drug policy, uh, we want to see public safety advancements in all three of these areas to make our community safer. On the amounts of drugs, do you know of any legitimate organizations in Canada that would be able to supply them meth, cocaine, and heroin in those amounts? Or does this mean it would necessarily come from criminal drugs? Well, that, that I believe is what has been uh, sourced in um, previous media engagements by Dolph themselves, but definitely, you know, in terms of uh, achieving. Uh, people getting, uh, sourcing a safe supply of those substances, there's definitely you know, challenges, issues with trying to find um, pharmaceutical companies that will produce these substances or have the availability to, uh, to deliver them. So, there's certainly no legit way to get that much methamphetamine. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's no way, but I mean, you know, for a research purpose or, or what have you, there probably is, I mean, you can, um, there's medical grade heroin, there, there are ways to source uh, substances, whether for you know a pharmaceutical need uh, such as like fentanyl, um, there is a pharmaceutical <coughs> legitimate pharmaceutical uses. There's pharmaceutical companies that produce it, uh, but with all of those, it is controlled. They are substances that are governed uh, by the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So you need the the proper legal um, permissions to produce them, to sell them, to buy them. So I think you mentioned three big public safety threats. 
and you look for the law, I don't quite understand the connection between that and Joel. It seems to me that Joel was actually trying to ameliorate all of those issues. Is that? No. Well, I would, I would say, I would say, you know, uh, definitely when we've seen uh, people discuss, you know, uh, illicit supplies of drugs and saying that they're tested and therefore safe, uh, that would speak to the first public safety threat, the overdose crisis. But then it gets into discussion around how does the drug strategy or what's being proposed impact the other two avenues. So, in terms of organized crime, where are these drugs being sourced from? Are they being sourced legally from? a legal pharmaceutical manufacturer, or are they being sourced from the dark web invariably from organized crime? Um, which I think in this case, uh, you know, Dolph has made comments on themselves. And then lastly, are these substances being prescribed by a doctor? Are they essentially provided to, to people who use drugs? Uh, or are they sold? In which case, that in my mind doesn't address the underlying need to go out to commit, you know, petty survival crimes to address addiction. So. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to have open conversations around drug policies, ways we can innovate uh, as a society, but, you know, we're always going to look at those three public safety areas and say, you know, can we achieve benefits in all of them, not just one of them. Jane, go ahead, if you have one last question. Are you able to tell us, like, how many police resources have been used in investigations, like, the number of officers? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'd be. I'd be guessing. So I. I would do it a disservice if I. If I guess. But no, that's something I'd have to get back to you on. Thanks very much, everybody. If there's any other questions you have that come up later, uh, uh, media at vcd.ca, send them to us. We'll do our best to answer them as quickly as we can. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.